All right, guys, welcome to PacWest Bigfoot. Got my friend Dave here, and uh, <laughs> that's my name too. Um, anyways, um, uh, welcome to PacWest Bigfoot. Uh, got some really, uh, just a couple that, you know, Dave's had his own experience here. He's also got um, a really interesting uh, experience told to him uh, that he wanted to share and that I thought is uh, just awesome. So uh, real quick, PacWest Bigfoot on uh, Monday, I'm going to announce the winner of the awesome cards from Robin Hyatt. You can find her uh, artwork over there on Etsy. Also, that winner is going to get um, a uh, Southern California Sasquatch Organization members t-shirt. going to send that out as well. So there you have it. There's that. And don't forget, um, I, t I promised my friend uh, Gunner, I don't I don't get paid for this stuff, just so you know. Um, Sasquatch Coffee, um, I got some tree knock right here, but just so you guys know, if you feel like um, helping out, um, we they are celebrating uh, 50 years of the Patterson-Gimlin film there in Northern California. Uh, $15 for every purchase of the, uh, listen to this, the Bob Gimlin Bluff Creek blend right now. $15 of that is actually going to old Bob there and uh, deserve a Deservedly so. So um, get over there, grab some. Uh, I know me and my wife are going to grab a couple bags ourselves today, uh, get it sent out to us. So want to say thank you guys very much for doing that. Let's get on with this. We're going to talk to David here from the Northern California area. He's got uh, an experience of his own and something else pretty awesome and incredible. So Dave, I'm just going to let you take over, man. Go for it. Tell us where you're from and what happened. Sure. Um well, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and um, my father was a uh, physicist. And so from the time I was knee-high to a grasshopper, I was uh, raised in a culture of uh, scientific skepticism. Okay. Uh, that did not keep my dad from wondering about things like Bigfoot and ghosts and uh, UFOs. And at this point in my life, I've had some experience with all three of those things, uh, even though... I was initially a non-believer, so I needed I needed to see it myself in order to be convinced. So I'll tell you about my first experience with uh, what I believe was Bigfoot. Uh, this was in the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, and at the time, I had no idea that there had ever been any Bigfoot sightings in the Santa Cruz Mountains, but apparently there have been. In fact, uh, there's a Bigfoot museum. It's called, um, let's see, the Bigfoot Discovery Museum, which is yeah. in Felton. And uh, none of this was known to me at the time. All I knew was that my parents had bought some uh, land deep in a canyon near a mountain called Pine Mountain, which was on a uh, creek called Waddell Creek, which runs from Big Basin Park down to the coast. And it goes right by a lumber camp. And in order to get into this area, you had to come up from the coast and drive miles inland on an extremely bumpy road. And this is often the way many Bigfoot stories begin, isn't it? You know, you're driving on some r bumpy road. There's nobody there through a lumber camp. And what do you see running across the road? But Bigfoot. Well, anyway, we made camp. And... Um, this canyon, I have to add, since you want the atmosphere, was kind of spooky. Uh, it had a reputation for being haunted. And so I expected to see a ghost. I didn't expect to find any evidence of Bigfoot. And when, once we settled in, you know, and had gone swimming in the creek and we're sitting around the campfire and everything, um, we didn't have any kind of uh, expectation of paranormal phenomena. Mm -hmm. But earlier during the day, when we were out running around, and being kids, you know, we were running around a lot, we heard these loud knockings, wood knocking sounds coming from the mountain above us and across the creek. And we had heard other animal sounds in the area, like uh, screeching mountain lions or bobcats. But this wood knocking sound sounded human because it was coming at regular intervals, whack then a pause, then whack, and it was very heavy. So the only way I could imagine a human being doing it was having found two uh, logs, one cantilevered over the other, and then 
riding on the top log if it was kids and causing it to whack against the bottom log. Kind of like a, a methodical kind of, of whack, like you knew it was just methodical. It was like, you know. It was deliberate. It was not deliberate. a result of wind. That, that's for sure. Um, so we didn't think any more about it, but on a return visit, we heard it again. And it became almost a feature of being there. Uh, so it wasn't until much later, in fact, I think uh, when I saw Lauren Coleman's book on um, Bigfoot, uh, the true story of apes in America, that I actually found out about wood knocking as being the way the Bigfoot would signal to other Bigfoot in the area that there were people there or something was going on. Hmm. And, uh, and then I think <laughs> I still didn't make the connection. And I don't think I made the connection until I heard all the witness stories from your show that it was, it was likely that we were listening to Bigfoot at that time. Now, this really isn't the whole point of the story because one of the things skeptics say is, how could a giant ape live in the forests of North America where people are walking through all the time and not be seen more often? And I think your show proves that people do see Bigfoot very often. Mm -hmm. They just don't talk about it. And so if somebody's had an experience out in the wilderness, you know, I will ask them if they if they've ever seen Bigfoot or sensed that they were being watched or something peculiar was going on. And that's how I came by my second story. But I want to finish my first story first. And that is that night at about 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., the fog was filtering through the trees, and we were all sleeping peak by jowl on a tarp. And while we were asleep, about 30 wild pigs weighing up to 300 pounds apiece tiptoed through the camp, sniffing at everybody's sleeping bag. And nobody woke up except my friend Jim, who saw the whole thing. And I'm a light sleeper, and I didn't wake up. Jim's a totally reliable witness I've known my entire life. So I'm quite confident that there were wild pigs there. Now, not only would a wild pig be a food source for a Bigfoot yeah. and a deer around there, um, not to mention the wild berries and that kind of thing that grow in the forest there, but um, nobody had a clue that there were wild pigs there at all, and yet these <laughs> huge. And nobody even said that there were wild pigs in that That's funny. land. So I, I have no... No trouble believing that a um, gigantic man-like ape could live in this environment and not be detected if he didn't want to be detected. Yeah. There's just miles of forest there with undergrowth, thick undergrowth. I tried climbing the mountain, couldn't make it because there was so much undergrowth. It just wasn't, it wasn't going to be fun and it might even be dangerous. Yeah. And then beyond the mountain, there's miles and miles of other mountains and if Bigfoot wanted to travel, say, from the Big Sur uh, National Forest uh, near Big Sur all the way up to Santa Cruz and back, he could do it. He could just wait for a lull in the traffic and then race across the highway, particularly in the 60s when there weren't as many barriers across the center lane. Mm -hmm. But as recently, I believe it's 2005, somebody has seen Bigfoot in the Santa Cruz mountains and then hearing about that kind of led me, well, it strengthened my case for that, what we heard up there at, around Big Creek Lumber Company being Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And that takes care of story number one. Well, I, I also, real quick, we heard, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, the Finding Bigfoot team, you know, Cliff Berrickman and all them did a, a episode up there in, you know, up outside of uh, Santa Cruz there. Mm. And there, it, it, and as a matter of fact, I think if I'm correct, they actually threw the luau there with the pig and everything because somebody had mentioned that there was there was pig that ran around that area, and not a lot of people actually knew about that. It, it, not even a lot of locals know that. You mean there's wild boar running around here? Yeah, there's wild pig running everywhere. They run through Oregon. They run. Th they run through the Pacific Northwest like crazy. So, and people don't really know that they're not, might be, you know, you guys might have more of a population than say we do in our area. But the thing is, is they're still around, 
you know. And there's lots of virgin forest there. Oh, there's so much. It's not even funny. I mean, you guys, even in Santa Cruz and the mountains and the mountain ranges and everything through there, people have not set their foot everywhere in there, even to this day. So Absolutely. There there's no go. incentive to climb a, a into a jungle like Pine Mountain and keep on going. There's no trails there. There's nothing. Yeah, and, e and even if people have, how many? You know, a few hundred, a few score over the period of what? Since they've been in this part of the world, you know? Yeah. 200 years <laughs> it's like, know, people will create a that, road and then use the road that's yeah that's what people do path of least resistance <laughs> so okay nice. so the second one this is yeah let's do this well i went to a birthday party in el cajon where, where i was living at the time and i i really didn't expect to uh hear a bigfoot story at this party i just expected to drink a few beers and uh hang out you know but it so happened that there was somebody there who, who had actually seen Bigfoot, and it was a very dramatic sighting. And um, somebody told me about this, so I went right up to him and I said, uh, have you actually seen Bigfoot? And he kind of chuckled and said, yeah, he had. Now, let me describe the witness. Uh, this fellow was a, a captain in the US Navy, retired. And as I was telling Dave earlier, as sober as a judge, uh, I think he was a very reliable witness. And I found his story completely credible, even though it was incredible. Um, but it went like this. He was, he was a hunter. He really liked hunting. And he had a, there was a group of four hunters who were going to meet up in British Columbia at a certain place where they could hunt elk, I guess. Big game. So they brought their heavy, you know, game rifles with them. And the guy I was speaking to went with his friend in a pickup truck. The other hunters had already gone ahead and they'd made camp up the road and they had GPS coordinates to get there because as soon as you left the main road, you were on a lumber road that was extremely primitive, bouncy, bumpy, and, and it was the wilderness on all sides of you miles and miles of it and you had to make to make your way about 15 miles up this road to join the other group of hunters okay so it's getting late in the day as they're approaching the other hunters campsite when suddenly out of nowhere off the side of the road a gigantic rock comes flying through the air and hits the driver's side door and puts a dent in it and they slam on the brakes and they can't even believe what has just happened uh, they jump out of the um, truck and grab their rifles, and they look around. And there's nobody there. They don't know what to make of this, but it was spooky as hell. So I don't think any of them had any experience with Bigfoot before, so they didn't immediately assign it to a hostile Bigfoot. But when they drove on up the road a couple more miles, and they got to the camp, and now it was about sundown, um, and met up with the other hunters. The other hunters said, you met up with our Bigfoot because for the two days they'd already been there, uh, a very big Bigfoot had been harassing them by throwing stones at them. Huh. And, um, <clears throat> of course, they had guns. And, but they were never able to get a shot off at this thing because it, would, it was so good at hiding and it would come around twilight and hurl the rocks at them. So this was very exciting to all these hunters. They said, why don't we go hunting for Bigfoot? And if we shoot him, we'll make millions of dollars. So that became the new plan. Instead of hunting elk, they were going to hunt Bigfoot. And um, so the next day, the dawn rolled around, and they went hunting all day and found absolutely nothing. And so that night, when they went back to camp, the Navy captain, I'll just call him John, John and his friend, decided they would go back to where Bigfoot rolled a rock at the truck, and they make their camp there in hopes of seeing him again. Uh -huh. And when they got there, you know, it was before sundown, so they, um, they threw a rope over a tree limb some distance from the camp and hung their food 50 feet off the ground. Yeah. 
and uh, by a nylon rope that from the sounds of it was a very strong nylon rope capable of supporting a thousand pounds, something like that. And they were sure their food was safe. So they made camp and they slept that night without any encounters with Bigfoot. But when they got up in the morning and they went to check their food, the, um, the, uh, what do you call the freezer was on the ground. It had been ripped out of its, uh, uh, harnesses and fallen to the ground. Apparently what, this is what the guy, John thought he thought that Bigfoot had shimmied up the tree. And why do, why was he sure it was Bigfoot? Well, this wasn't something a bear would do really. Uh, that's the point of hanging your food from a, a limb on a tree. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, he did see Bigfoot later uh, that same day. And I'm going to come to that in just a second. Anyway, so they surmised that Bigfoot went up the tree and he shimmied out onto the limb. And then he grabbed hold of the rope and swung his entire body weight from the rope and it snapped. And Or when he grabbed hold of the, um, of the freezer, one of the uh, harnesses slipped loose and down it went. At any rate, he had no trouble dropping 50 feet to the ground. Uh, and they found footprints. Oh, okay, there's the sure thing. He did say they found two very deep footprints next to the uh, freezer, which had been broken open and rifled. Mm -hmm. So now they had a trail to follow to see if they could actually hunt down Bigfoot. So the two of them um, took their broken freezer back to the pickup truck. They got their rifles, and they started following the tracks off into the forest. And after a while, the tracks petered out. They, they couldn't, they didn't see Bigfoot. And they kept on moving kind of randomly around. And at one point, and they've been doing this for hours, by the way, at this point. At one point, John got out in front of his friend, and he saw light through the trees up ahead. And so he went toward that light, and he found himself on the edge of a ravine, looking down a, a very steep uh, drop to a creek or a stream going down below. And across the ravine from him, standing up as big the expression on his, of his body language and his face was defiant, like, okay, take your shot. I don't give a damn. And so he did. He, he lifted his rifle, and he got Bigfoot in his sights. And at that, at that point, he decided, I can't do it. I said, why didn't you shoot? And he said, because I would have felt like a murderer if I'd shot him. And I've heard other people say this, you know? No, same here. They, same here. Yeah, they've had Bigfoot in their sights, but they couldn't pull the trigger because he looked too human. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, tell me about his face, you know, and he gave me the uh, details. And I was I was pretty clear that he had seen a very human like face kind. You know, I said um, uh, human like nose, eyes, uh, dark brown, but, you know, oval shaped and blinking and um, high cheekbones and. Uh, no fur on the face, just a uh, naked face and dark skin. These were, it, he was in British Columbia, and you know, they tend to be darker up there, uh, mm -hmm. the fur. And also, they tend to be bigger following some theorem in biology. So, this was a very big specimen of Bigfoot. And after standing up and daring this uh, guy to shoot him, Bigfoot just turned around and jumped off a. Uh, little run there and scurried down the hill and was gone in a second. Then his friend caught up with him and he had only his story to tell his friend. Who knows if his friend might not have taken the shot. You know, people in groups behave differently than people all by themselves. So when it was yeah. just him, I think he was a little bit wary of shooting somebody, something that looked so much like a human being. And he could only say to his friend, you know, I saw a Bigfoot. And he's gone. And that's the story. And to me, it just illustrates how, you know, if you're curious about this kind of thing, 
you will meet plenty of people who have seen uh, Bigfoot out there. And I think your show proves that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's not a mess. The sightings really aren't too rare when you consider how many people actually go out into the wilderness. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we always look at things like, um, you know, like a, a BFRO map or something, and it starts highlighting all these little dots everywhere as if somebody's got a tack on, you know, maps of, you know, a map on their wall where Bigfoot has been sighted and you see it just, it just lights up. And you find that, of course, you know, through the Pacific Northwest, Northern California and up, it's the lightest of, you know, it's the brightest of anywhere. But of course, you've got some spread. But to me, it looks like it kind of goes like this, you know. It's kind of like a little bit in the Northeast up through Canada real good. And then the Pacific Northwest is just like, it's the handle on the coffee mug. That's just pure black. It's just, yeah. it's just so thick. Uh, Most rainforest there. Yeah. I like that environment fast. Exactly. Because it, people don't understand that it's like when you're running through the Cascades, you've got two sides to the Cascade mountain range, really. You've got coastal and then you've got central. And, you know, if you're going through the central part of the Cascades, it's very, um, you know, it's it's pine forest. It's, it can be dry in the summer. It can be wet in the winter, blah, blah, blah. But you go through the coastal part and it's just like it's constantly a pretty uh, damp, moist uh, uh, um, you know, rich with with berries and food and every constantly. It, it's you know, it's like the Amazon running up through here, all the way up through Canada. And um, so I, I keep telling people, it's like, you know, if 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 they migrate at all, it's from one side of the range to the other side of the range. You right. get over on the coastal range during the winter. It's actually not that bad. It's rainy and it's cold, but you don't get as much snow as you go. You get over here all of a sudden, and even me, I believe that even the deer and the elk and everything seem to migrate more coastal uh, during those times of seasons. And I think that there's actually studies out there to prove that. Um, and, of course, I think that Bigfoot is really just going to migrate from one side to the other. And that's right. what they do. And we always notice that when do we see a lot more, you know, when do we get a lot more uh, 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 visuals on these things? Usually during those seasonal changes, you know, from spring to fall or, or winter to spring, you know, we start getting a lot of this, uh, a lot of the um, actual sighting sightings then. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, and your whole thing about pigs, I mean, that just, that's another one of those things that you, you hear and you're just like, well, that makes sense. I mean, if many locals where you live are like, we got pigs here, <laughs> we got wild <laughs> pigs. It's like, yeah, we've got wild pigs and there's like 300 of them one night and some of them weigh like 200 pounds. You know, they're mm -hmm. huge, you know. And I hear, you know, pigs are highly intelligent, but uh, nothing compared to uh, the intelligence of Bigfoot. If yeah, no. Know you know, I always, you know, people ask me about that as well. They're just like, well, you know, it being highly intelligent. I mean, I was like being highly intelligent and being an animal is, is, you know, different than being highly intelligent, being a human. But at the same time, a highly intelligent animal means that their, their instincts are so sharp <laughs> and just so, they're just so aware of everything that their reactions seem just you know, almost, you know, precognitive in a way, you know, it's just like, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. And that's high, that's highly intelligent. Um, that's, you know, for a wild animal. I mean, it just comes with instinct. With better yeah. hearing and better sense of smell. by Yeah. They're not sitting in front of video games every day, getting fat on jello and ice cream. You know, <laughs> they're, they're out there trying to survive on salmon berries and pig. You know, walking up and down these ravines that we're like, ugh, you know, a miner 150 years ago might not even go up. Right. So, you know. Yeah. Your life depends on that ability. Yeah, it so does. They have to be well equipped with superior senses to do that. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You know, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they're a part of that creation that is just this creation that's just so highly you know, 
their instincts are just so sharp that they almost do seem almost precognitive in a way. And that's why I think some people can sit there and go, well, maybe they're from outer space or maybe they're the, I don't think so. I just think that they're really that intelligent. Um, you know, just are, but that was awesome. The tree knocks. The one thing that I've always, um, two things that I think always have proved right off the bat that there's something to all of this wasn't just the visuals from people. Mm -hmm. It's actually things like tree knocks or rock throwing. Nothing throws rocks <laughs> in the woods. You've got to have hands. You've got to have hands and arms. I was just saying that in a live thing on the YouTube live I do on Fridays. I was like, you got to have hands and arms to be throwing stuff out here. And you got to have hands and arms to be going whack, whack, whack. And when it's done in such a methodical fashion, I mean, your father, you said, was a scientist. He could yeah. not the doll myth anything. You know how methodical he probably was. He was. Yeah. Everything. It's just pouring his coffee could have been methodical. Like <laughs> <laughs> You might so, say that. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, is that when you when you hear something like that out there, um, you know, it's just it's like the night we heard what we heard, you know, thud, thud, splash, thud. And then it started crashing up. And as soon as we were out of the tent, whatever it was stopped, it didn't continue like a normal wild animal would getting away. It stopped all of a sudden, whatever it was stopped and probably hunkered down real quick. It just went. So the silence was as significant as the sound. Yeah, Nothing. exactly. And see, I'm kind of about to give a little something away, but one of the um, encounter stories that, you know, of course I do a little backstory to everything, but in his experience, what he told me was uh, what he said was, he was looking at it from one side of a road. All right. And he was looking at them. Actually, it was a few of them. And there was a road in between them that wasn't, you know, it was driven on every day by cars here and there, but it's still kind of out of far out of, out of a town. But he said, as soon as it heard the car coming, he watched as they all stepped into a mess of trees and became statues almost. Wow. There was no movement from these things. They just went foom. It was as if they he was like he was like if just from where he was, he was like, even if I was you know any closer, I swear I probably would think those things were just stumps or trees. Wow. I would walk past it. And he's all that's what really freaked me out. He's all, if I really freaked out about anything and seeing this was the fact that he, at that point he said, I actually looked around me to make sure there wasn't any on my left or right or anything or in behind me. Cause he was like, I, I don't know how many times we drive past them or even simply walk past them and not even know. Um, if, if there's time, I, I wanted to get a word in about scientific skepticism. Yeah, go for it. Sure. Um, my father was a very good physicist uh, and made some important discoveries in physics. And he always viewed as a uh, he always viewed skepticism as a tool for def uh, investigating the truth, mm -hmm. not as a tool for ending all discussion of what was possible and not possible. Yes. So when all these witnesses came forward with stories about Bigfoot. It was very similar to the situation uh, with UFOs. Um, that what if we just take as a starting point that the witnesses tell the truth? They really don't have that much vested interest in telling tall tales, but they all seem to be um, interested in finding out what it was that they saw. And this is true of UFOs. It's also true of uh, Bigfoot. And then see where it, where it leads us, where the investigation leads us. What can we find out using science as an investigative tool instead of a, uh, a way to curtail any discussion? And uh, I, I, I go along with that philosophy completely. Mm -hmm. No, That's me too. I mean, I, you know, as far as the uh, encounter stories, you know, I create based on true stories. I take these encounters, I create the backstory in like kind of like Native American storytelling fashion around them. 
I don't do any sort of research into whether or not they're true. I leave that to this particular part of what I do online. This is where I wanted to kind of, you know, make sure that there was some sort of credibility to what these people are saying, you know, by bringing in real folks going, hey, this is what I saw. This is what I experienced. That's what I wanted to do for that. But um, I'm with you on healthy skepticism. Skepticism led me to be a creationist because that's how I was kind of led to the Lord was like, okay, something from nothing. Mm -hmm. I got to figure out what's that something because <laughs> that's all we have. I mean, that's the answer now. There's some, there's, you know, something, you know, it, it, you can't have nothing. You can't have something from nothing. Mm -hmm. There has to be something there to begin. So I started doing my research that way. And then, you know, I always have goofy people, you know, asking me like, well, you know, how did you get the Bigfoot on the ark? Blah, blah, blah. And I started thinking, well, 95% of all mammals, air breathing mammals are smaller than a house cat. Scientists have already proved that there's, there is so much room on that ark. You could have housed them and food for 18 years. Who cares? There was plenty of room for land breathing mammals. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm like, why not a Sasquatch? Why not a Bigfoot? Absolutely. And, you know, you remind me of something else um, about uh, John's sighting and his inability to shoot Bigfoot when he had a clear shot a reasonably short distance away. I'm sure he could have brought down Bigfoot at that point. Oh, yeah. Easily, but he didn't do it. Um, and that is uh, Melba Ketchum's... Um, Analysis of DNA, yeah. which shows a, um, a human uh, mother for Bigfoot. And, you know, I thought that's really unbelievable. But on the other hand, DNA doesn't lie. So what does it mean? Do you have any ideas about that? I, you know, I don't. I don't really. <clears throat> From a biblical standpoint, a creationist standpoint, I don't have any sort of clue about that. Um, you know, whether or not I'd have to look at that evidence myself and be, you know, in there studying the old genome. And I'm not that brilliant. I'm not that smart. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I wish I was. Um, but for something to sit there and um, have similar attributes to us, we live in the same biosphere. Some things are going to have thumbs. Some things are going to have fingers. Some things are going to have legs and arms. We look at chimps. We look at apes. We look at all of this. And if somebody's like, "Well, how come we're we're kind of we're so similar to that?" And I was like, "Well, we share. You know, ninety-two percent of our DNA is shared with a rat, but I'm not a rat. You know." Um, the thing is, though, is that there are some things that we're going to share a similar kind of physical makeup with. Because we live in the same biosphere. We need, it's the same natural laws that affect us, affect them. And so, you know, that's just, that's just what we do know. You know, um, do I believe they're kind of a half human, half ape thing? No, I don't. I believe that they are a complete primate of some mm -hmm. kind. Um, do they have a different physical feature that looks more humanish? I mean, look at some of those, those crazy funky looking monkeys with the longer noses. I mean, they look like, you know that actor back in the 40s or 50s is like uh, Jimmy you know? yeah there you go um so you know you you can take some of these things and we can try to mesh them together if we want um we weren't there at the beginning and we only have what we know now and in, in the evidence at hand um far as i'm concerned i find this thing to be and I believe it to be an unknown primate. And actually, I don't think it's unknown anymore. I think it's a Bigfoot. I think it's a Sasquatch. I think it came over from a land bridge between, um, you know, uh, basically Russia and, you know, northern parts of, of all of that and in America, North America. Um, that land bridge was here not long ago. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago that that land bridge was here. Um, there was Native American stories about that land bridge. So, you know, you start thinking about it a few earthquakes later and, and that stuff can be buried. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, we're only what, you know, 10 miles, 15 miles away from Russia. Mm -hmm. And as True. a matter of fact, some parts of that were only waist deep because <laughs> you're standing on some mountains there, or some big tall hills, you know, right across that. So who knows, you know, um, 
that's just been my thoughts and my ideas about it. But if you guys hear helicopters, we have fires going on here. So we've got. Oh, yeah. Well, I hope you're safe there. Oh, we're fine. Is there about 20, 20 miles, 25 miles that way? Um, yeah, it's been it's been a little hectic for people around here, and it's been a real blessing to have such great firefighters, all those guys out there, and no accidents or problems yet. So it's been kind of nice. There, there's um, I'm old enough to remember um, the first sighting of Patty. It was mm -hmm. preceded by some stories about Bigfoot. Um, wrecking equipment in a lumber, uh, a lumber Gary crew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I read those stories in the San Francisco Chronicle and I, I was fascinated even then by the Bigfoot story. And I, I don't know how old I was, I was 13 years old or something, mm -hmm. but, um, I think what we're seeing now is that, um, skeptics are having more trouble maintaining their position in light of all the photographic evidence that's coming to light and the DNA evidence and it's chipping away at that position slowly. And I, I do hope that within our um, lifetime, we'll see a solution to this uh, question. Well, and yeah, I'm, I'm like you. I, I don't even think that skeptics should even be anything. Um, eventually you take you, you can't just be a skeptic about it forever. It, you weigh the evidence and you make up your mind. Skeptic, being a skeptic, if you're a skeptic your whole life, about what? <laughs> you can't sit around and be a skeptic all the time. Being a skeptic about something is, is something that you're actually doing while you're trying to figure out, you know, weighing the, the evidence. Mm -hmm. And then you're not a skeptic anymore. You're going to decide either way. Skepticism isn't some sort of, professional <laughs> you know um you know, whatever it's you know you're you're not a professional skeptic right you know although people do that today and i don't get it i don't understand being a professional skeptic well some people feel reassured by the skeptical viewpoint so that's it it still doesn't <laughs> it still doesn't make any sense <laughs> but you know it's like your father, you know, he sits there and he goes, I have a theory. Oh, crud, that's not matching my theory. Then it's not true. Oh, look, it is matching what I'm believing. I'm seeing all this evidence. So I go here. Either way, he had to make up his mind whether he wanted it to be so or not. He had to go where the evidence was. And so I tend to go with the evidence. I saw tracks that couldn't be explained. I heard something in the middle of the night that I don't get. It doesn't fit anything unless, of course, it was some big, huge Portland trailblazer running around in the middle of the night who actually had to be at least twice the size of a Portland trailblazer and or uh, was walking at the same time, but, you know, in the same area 20 years earlier. Um, cause mine were spread between 20 years. There was a 20 year spread between the incidences, but only a spread of two to three miles and where it, it occurred. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, that's, you know, that was it. And plus everything that I hear from people, even from yourself, the tree knocking, come on, <laughs> it's like you're going up a ravine that you're not even willing to walk up, you know? And I know that your dad is probably like, get all the evidence you can about everything before you make a strong decision. And you're like, man, I'd like to get up there, but nobody's getting up there. Unless they're crawling and they're willing to spend the next two days crawling up the side of this hill just to make some knocks with some big old logs, just to get my attention, hoping I might be there at that point in time. Yeah. I'm less afraid of, of believing in something that, is untrue than I am of missing out on an absolutely incredible phenomenon like yeah. Bigfoot. I'm willing to risk, say, mm, you know, being wrong. Um, yeah. And I felt that way about uh, UFOs. I felt that way about Bigfoot. Yeah. And I was very skeptical of ghosts, but then I actually encountered one. And even though I don't like to say that, I, I did. So, Oh, you know, I get people, you know, even at my church, they're just like, oh, mm -hmm. Bigfoot. But then all of a sudden I have some come up to me and go, you know, I was hunting once. And <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's like, and what? And they're like, well, um, 
this is what I heard. And it was just kind of weird, creepy. And they had heard, you know, some heavy walking, you know, that just kept shadowing what they were doing wherever they went the whole time. And it freaked them out. But it was a heavy bipedal walk. Or, you know, uh, a one, one, one gal heard uh, uh, wood knocks. And I'm just like, well, where'd you hear that at? Well, I was up in the Callahan's, you know. Uh, wood knocks are a very distinctive sound. Uh, it just can't be. You can't beat rock throwing and wood knocks. you got to have hands and arms for it. Absolutely. So you only got two choices. You got human beings or you've got some sort of bipedal, huge old monster running around the woods called Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. That's all you got. Well, you know, I told you that I thought of, I thought of a kid sitting on a teeter totter log and knocking it against a log that was lower than that. But then when we came back three different times and that same kid was sitting on the teeter totter <laughs> log and knocking it, yeah, like, no. Wow, that's really something. In the middle of the woods. Yeah, in that's what I'd have my kids woods. doing. <laughs> Halfway up a mountain in the middle of the undergrowth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My kids aren't going up in the woods just to do that. I was like, what's the sense in that? <laughs> so, yeah. No, that's awesome. But um, anyways, uh, stick around for just a second, David. I'm going to mm -hmm. say thank you guys very much for being on uh, the old interview here. And uh, don't forget, go over to PacWestBigfoot.com. You guys can sign up there and get on and I give away a little something monthly every single month. Um, something cool could be a coffee mug, could be some coffee, could be a t-shirt or whatever, but uh, get on over there and sign on up. So with that, thank you guys very much. And I will see you on the next PacWest Bigfoot interview. Thanks.